The following message is a production of Tony Broom Ministries. Our lesson title today is Follow in Christ's Footsteps. I have to think of that song, Footsteps of Jesus, Footprints of Jesus that makes the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where'er they go. And we need to do that, following in His footsteps. That means doing what He says do, living by the Word of God. If Jesus says we can do the works that He does, we ought to do them in His name. If He says heal the sick, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover, that's what we ought to do. If He says preach the gospel, that's what we ought to do. If He says cast out demons, that's what we ought to do. We can do what He says do because we're doing it in His name. We're following in the footsteps of Jesus. Sometimes those footsteps lead through dark and lonesome valleys, don't they? We have to suffer not for Jesus in the sense that, well, you're my child, now you've got to suffer. But we suffer because of living for the Lord. We suffer because of being a Christian. We suffer because of taking a stand for Jesus Christ. Sometimes when you stand for Christ, you have to stand alone. But you still have to take a stand anyway. And you have to stand for the Lord. It's good to have people to stand with you. And it's good to hear an amen when you know you need it. And people can stand there and they agree. And you're having that mutual spirit and an amen. But whether you get an amen or not, whether anybody stands with you or not, if you're standing on God's Word, you have to stand By yourself, you still keep on standing. Scripture said, when you've done all to stand, just keep on standing. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through chapter 4, verse 19 is our study text today. And our central truth is, Christ has shown us how to live and die being pleasing to God. Whether we live or die, we are the Lord's, the Scripture tells us. And He has shown us how to please God. He's shown us how to live. He's shown us how to die. He's shown us how to please God. How? Because when He came, He lived among us as one of us. And when He died, He died as one of us. Even though He's the Son of God, He died as God the Son. But He, whether He lived or died, He showed us. That was an example. You can live for God. Even in the midst of a sinful and adulterous generation, you can live for God. And he lived for God during one of the most oppressing times. The Roman government was in charge. That is, as far as this world was concerned. And he lived for God. And you and I can live for God too during the day that we live in. We think this day is just so bad, just the worst time ever. As the kids say, the worst day ever. Because this is the day that we live in. This is the only one we're really acquainted with. We study about history, we know a little bit about that, and we've heard about the bad times that people have had in the past, but we know about where we are because that's where we are now. But people all throughout the ages have had bad times. The prophets, look how they suffered. The people in, you read Fox's Book of Martyrs, look how they suffered for Christ during the time of the Middle Ages and even later. And people are still suffering for the Lord. Our Bible focus tells us about that. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. 1 Peter 2, 21. We are suffering for him and suffering because we live for him, and we're called on to follow his steps. Even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us. He suffered in our stead, and we're called on to be followers of Him. We follow Him in His triumph. We follow Him in His victory. We follow Him in the things that He's given us to do, but we also follow Him in the sufferings. And He's called upon us to do that. The first part, live blamelessly. It didn't say live perfectly. None of us can do that, and I suppose if you look at the word blameless, none of us are completely blameless, but that's something that we can strive for. We're to strive to be more like Christ, more like Jesus would I know, more of His grace to others show. 
more of his saving fullness see, more of his love who died for me, more, more about Jesus. And we're to live blamelessly in that respect. This is chapter 3, 1 Peter, verses 8 through 12. And I have a little sense of humor, as you know I do, and maybe a big sense of humor, I'm not sure, but I couldn't help but tell my wife, I said, you know, the first scripture it starts off with, it says, finally. Did you notice that? Finally. Well, wait a minute now, we're just getting started. But he says, finally be ye all of one mind. This is a mutual cause. We're standing up together for Christ. We may not like the same kind of clothes or cars or same kind of coffee or tea or the same kind of food, but we're to be all of one mind. We're to go in the same way, believing the same way. We may not agree on every little tickly thing, but we're to agree and have the same mind. Be ye all of one mind. That is, having the mind of Christ. We cannot make it if some are having the mind of Christ and some are having the mind of the world. We're pulling against each other. We have to have the mind of Christ. Having compassion one of another. We are compassionate towards each other, and that's mutual too. We have compassion. Love as brethren. Love like brothers and sisters ought to love. Be pitiful, and he's talking about be full of pity, full of mercy. Nobody is healed by your sympathy, but we do need to have mercy on people. Nobody is healed because you say, well, I sure hope you get better. I hope your head quits hurting. I know my uncle died of that, but I sure hope you get better. Nobody is healed because of that. They're have our sympathy, but they're not healed because of it. But we are to be merciful people because Christ had mercy on us. Christ had pity on us. Yes, he felt sorry for us. I don't want nobody feeling sorry for me. You better be glad God did. He does feel sorry for us and he had mercy and pity on us and we're to be that way towards each other. Because if I exact on you, or let's turn it around, if you exact on me every little thing I do wrong or say wrong, you'd have your ruler out and your measuring tape out all the time because I come up short. We cannot exact on each other like that and keep sizing up or sizing down whichever way you want to look at it because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're to be pitiful towards each other and have pity on each other and be courteous sometimes it's just a sanctified nicety being nice most Christians especially Pentecostals they know how to say hallelujah but they had not learned how to be nice yet they got hallelujah head in the clouds but they can't speak to you when you come in the door Something wrong with their lips or something. They don't crack their face if they talk to you. Act like their mother in law doesn't move in for the summer or the winter. We've got to be courteous toward one another. Nobody wants to be one to Christ if that's the kind of thing they're coming into. I want you to get saved. I'm the meanest person in the world, but I want you to get saved. It'll make you mean just like I am, make you ugly like I am, and you might not can help that. But I want you to get saved. I want you to be just like me. No. Well, we want to be like Christ. And Christ didn't act the way that we act sometimes. We do not act Christ-like all the time. And God wants us to be Christ-like. He's telling us here to live blameless, and He's talking about being Christ-like, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto call that ye should inherit a blessing. We're all about blessing. We're not getting even Stephen. We're not about you did that to me. You just wait till I get up from here. He could have said that on that cross. You wait till I get off of this cross. I'll show you who's boss. But he didn't do that. He who reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. But 
he committed himself to him who judges righteously. And he committed his cause to God. And that's the way you and I have to do. We don't understand sometimes what people do and how they say things. And we don't understand a lot of things, but we commit it to God. And cast all our care upon him, for he cares for us. Instead of using all of our energy to rail on somebody or to try to exact upon them, as I said before, and try to find out what they're doing wrong, we should spend that energy to bless people. To bless contrarywise, rather, he says, blessing, because you know that you have been called thereunto to inherit a blessing. And we ought to be so happy about the blessings that God has given us that we are inheriting that we don't have time to put anybody down and rail on one another because we're talking about the blessings that God has given us. And now Peter quotes from Psalm 34, verses 12 through 16. It's not just words that God had given them, and certainly every word of God is inspired, but they reinforced, if you will, what the Old Testament said. And if you read Psalm 34 there, it will basically say the same thing he's saying here. And he's repeating it in New Testament terms so that we can hear it again. God has said something. If he says something more than one time, he's without doubt going to say or reinforce what he's already said. And if God never talks to you again, somebody's always waiting on hearing a new word. But if God has already spoken to us, and He's already spoken in His Word, why do we need a new Word when God's already given us His Word in His Word? Well, I don't, I don't feel like it. I don't know how I feel. It's not about how we feel. It's what He said. If God says, I can do these things, I can do it. Not because I can do it, but He says I can do it, and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not because I'm good enough to do it. It's not because I'm perfect enough to do it. It's not because I'm well enough to do it. Sometimes we think, well, I would do the works of Christ. I would pray for the sick, but I'm not well enough yet. You look around at all of us. If you wait till you get well enough and perfect enough, we'll never do anything in His name. We've got to do it because His Word says to do it, not because I'm well enough, not because I feel like it. He that will love life and see good days. Now, who wouldn't want to do that? Who in their right mind, with half sense, wouldn't want to have a good life and see good days? Here's how you do it. Go get you a bottle of silver and take it. No, that's not what he said. He says, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile or deceit. Not any new thing. He said, I don't give you a new commandment. I've given you the same commandment you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. If you love somebody, you're not going to say bad things about them. And you don't want nobody else saying bad things about them. That is a way that we do within our family. You wouldn't let me cross your family. You'd be done led me in a hole and drop me off the cliff. That's the way it is about the family of God. We shouldn't like it when people tear the family of God up or tear them down, whichever way you want to look at it. And the way that you have a good life, the way that you see good days, is to keep your tongue from evil, your lips, that they would speak no deceit. Let him eschew... That means run away from evil and do good. You run away from evil. I preached a sermon recently. It don't matter how many liquor bottles is in the room. It don't matter how many drug needles is in that room. If Jesus Christ has set you free, you're not bothered by that anymore. Shalabatalabadai. Hallelujah. If he sets you free, you're not worried about that anymore. Yes, we're tempted by different things, but God has the power to set us free. And that's what he says. Get away from evil. Run away from it if you have to. But if he sets you free, it doesn't matter. This world is full of evil. 
where we're not looking for the evil. They always say if you look for trouble, you can find it. Why? Because there's trouble out there, and another reason is because you're looking for it. If you're looking for it, you're part of the problem because you're causing trouble. You're the other side of that magnet. That magnet needs some steel to get a hold to. But if you're not that steel, that magnet, that magnet's not going to draw you and you're not going to be pulled into trouble. As stew, that's what, that word sounds funny to us, but it's the word about Job. Job in the Old Testament. He did good and astewed evil. He went away from evil and that's the way that he's talking to us here. Let him go away from evil, as do evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. And Psalm 34 says, pursue it. You have to run from evil and run towards peace. Well, let me talk to you a little bit. You find people that do that? Most of the time, Shaw was shooting... They want to talk to you about something that ain't no good. Well, we'll go out to lunch and talk a little bit. Now, why can't you talk about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? Why can't you talk about the power of God? Why can't you talk about the anointing? You want to talk about some fibbly biblically stuff that doesn't matter to anything. It's going to tear somebody down. The Scripture is telling us here that we should run after peace and after good things. I think about... The doors of the church. People standing in the doors of the church. What you talking about? If you're talking about bad things, it's going to have an evil spirit right there when you come in the door. You've got to talk about good things. The good things of God. Whatsoever things are true and holy and pure and righteous and of good report. If there be any virtue and praise, think on these things. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and His ears are open to their prayers. God is looking over you. If you're doing what's right and you're living right and serving God, His eyes are upon you. He's looking over you and His ears are open to your prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. We want God to help us out every time we get in a jam. But if we don't believe like His Word says believe, we don't want to live like God says to live, but yet we want to ask Him to help us out in every little thing we get into. But we won't want to live like the way God wants us to live. We shouldn't expect Him to hear and answer our prayers if we're not going to love Him and serve Him and do what He says. Verse 15 and 16, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Let Him be holy in your heart. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Always be ready. You don't have to go out and jump on top of the table and preach a sermon. But somebody says, why are you happy? Why do you have a good attitude? Don't say, well, my mama was like that. My daddy was like that. I just got good genes. Good genes, what are they, Levi's or what? Don't say no good genes. Ain't got nothing to do with your genes. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the Father and the Son. That's what it's got to do with Always be ready to give that person a reason. This is why I'm like that. God has made a difference in my life. has nothing to do with me whatsoever. It's all about Jesus. He's done it all. With meekness, you're not bragging. Braggadocious on yourself. Grandiosis. Hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. That's not what you're about. You're all about Jesus. It's about Him. I'm just a regular Joe, just a regular Danny, just a regular Tony, just a regular whoever. It's all about him. Because see, if it was me, if it was something big about me, then nobody else could do it but me. But since it's all about him, that means anybody can do it. God can make a difference in anybody's life. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. They may not serve God, but they cannot deny what God is doing in your life. There's no way in the world they can deny the love and the power of God that's going on in your life. This second section talks about living right. That's all it's talking about is just living right. The end of all things is at hand. That's a good thing to know. But if you're not living right, you don't want the end of all things to be at hand. Woo! 
Woo-hoo! Don't come now, Lord. But if you're living right, come on, Lord Jesus. Bring it on, bring it on. Be ye all therefore sober, more than just without alcohol. Sober, be balanced. Help us, Lord. Be balanced, amen. Watch unto prayer. Pray about these things. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. It's a hot love, sanctified, more than Elvis Presley. A hunk of hunk of burning love. You are, have a fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. I can have charity and I can look and I can say, you know, old Denny, he didn't mean to say that. He didn't, that's not him. He's not like that. Denny Ray's not like that. Brother Danny's not like that. They love Jesus. And we overlook these little things that cause people to stumble sometimes. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Don't say, well, I'll do it, but I don't really want to do it. No, be glad you can do it for Jesus. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We're just ministering to each other in Jesus' name. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles and the word of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability that God gives, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're just ministering the way that God gives us to minister. It's not that one gift is any more important than the other. It all goes together. Music, preaching, singing, skits for Jesus, whatever it is, healing gifts, miracle gifts, Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, it all goes together. We minister as God gives the ability to whoever he wants to. And we endure suffering. Verses 12 through 16 and 19. What about all these things I have to go through as a Christian? Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't say, God is punishing me, I must be doing something bad. No, say, I'm suffering for Jesus, I must be doing something good. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If you are a partaker of sufferings for Jesus Christ, you can be assured that you're going to be a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. We have every right to rejoice. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. When you're suffering, just say, the spirit of God is resting on me, the glory of God is shining down on me. I'm suffering for Jesus. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or as an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Sometimes we suffer mess that we don't need to suffer if we keep our nose out of other people's business. Don't suffer as a murderer. Don't suffer as these other things. But... Yet, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Don't say, I'm suffering, I might as well quit, might as well give up. Say, I'm suffering for Jesus, I'm going to keep on going, I'm going to keep on living for God no matter what. I'm going to keep on standing, I'm going to commit the keeping of my soul to God. He's able to keep me. He's able to help me. He's able to bring me through these trials that I'm coming through and going through. And He's able. If He's able to save me, He's able to sanctify me, He's able to baptize me in the Holy Ghost, He can keep me through this trial that I'm going through right now. And say like that song says, He will make this trial a blessing. He will turn all things for our good. I know that all things work together for the good of them who love God, the good of them who are called according to His purpose. And He says, you are called that you should follow His footsteps. That's the way that Jesus lived, and that's the way that we should live. Father, thank You for the opportunity to present this Word. Thank You for Your people, and thank You for the hunger and the hearts of Your people for Your Word. It will not be unnoticed. You will fill and you will do great and mighty things in the lives of your people today. And I pray that many would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. In his name, amen.
The preceding message has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.